de Bitcoin no, no sirve ni siquiera. Pero no lo hacía. Hace un segundo no lo hacía. Ah, ah no, el sonido sí. El sonido siempre pasa. El sonido es muy cabrón. Cuidado, ahora es de no caer. ¿Qué va a caer? Tengo el miedo de que caiga alguien. Ok, hello, hello, good afternoon to all. Very good to see some of our student faces, fresh, tanned, some of them. I hope you all had a great time. Welcome to the external people of IAC as well. Today I have the pleasure to present Eduard Cabe. Eduard Cabe, I'm going to sit next to you. <laughs> Um, I've met Eduard Cabe in 2006, uh, in my first year of working at IAC, and uh, he came as a jury, and he was criticizing the project in a way that I had never seen, and then I realized that that was the AA virus. <laughs> Then he adapted, I think, a bit into the spirit of IAC. But from 2006 and then, uh, he had been a very important faculty member of IAC. He has been um, leading different kind of seminars of digital fabrication, but as well, he's now leading and directing the introductory design studio with a lot of experimental work related with machinic protocols, as it's the theme of his lecture today. Uh, he's also um, an emergent practitioner. He's trying to survive in this uh, <laughs> difficult uh, architectural uh, world. He has founded um, the Office of Apparel. He has an amazing space just across the street. Um, and some of you have already been there because uh, he's preparing a very nice exhibition that will be opening in 11th of May, if I am not mistaken. What is the name of the exhibition? Traces. traces. Um, um, yeah, it's called Traces. <laughs> it's called Traces, okay. But some of the students' work will be exhibited there, so we will invite you all to visit it. Um, well, um, not many more to say. Eduard has been uh, uh, traveling, uh, teaching, and uh, working in different architectural offices around the world. He's also a professor at the EPFL in Lausanne. He has been teaching at the AA for many years, uh, and he has been also practicing in different places in Tokyo, in Brussels, now in Barcelona, and his projects are in Barcelona, but also around the world. Um, he's uh, one of uh, those young minds that they are trying to connect the impact of the information era, uh, the digital technologies, but also without losing the basic principles of uh, drawing. The drawings that he is producing either by himself or with the students are a piece of art. So um, I'm very, very happy, Eduard, for having you here in our lecture series, and I'm very happy that you are a very important faculty at IAC. It's a pleasure and it's an honor. Thank you very much. Please help me welcome him. So I suspect that, uh, that there are within the crowd uh, a group of people here, probably a group of students, that um, after having spent a couple of months with me, um, having to face my, uh, my uh, extensive criticism on the lines, criticizing probably the, the position of the line, the length of the line, the direction of the line, probably even the thickness of the line. Um, after having to endure all of that, uh, I think they kind of uh, strategically decided to tonight invert the roles. Um, I didn't know that you were also part of that because I didn't remember that it was uh, one day in, a, in it was not your project, okay? <laughs> um, so I would like, I, I have the, the suspicion that uh, they're responsible somehow for, for asking me to be here tonight um, and to show my lines somehow. So I would like to, to thank you. Um, and I would also like, of course, to thank the school for, um, for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to be here and to, and to show my work. Um, 
it's not so easy to prepare a lecture and to do a lecture in, uh, in your home. Uh, let's say it's, I think it's uh, much more stressful than it is normally. I know most of you, probably all of you, and, uh, um, and I know also that you know probably fragments of my work. So to be here, it's been the occasion really to, to rethink um, a little bit about how to, to introduce what I do. Um, but also, um, having been so critical uh, before Christmas on, on, on your work uh, and being slightly nervous now on, on uh, having to be criticized myself, uh, I made a very smart move. Um, I've decided not to present my work, but to present your work. So I'm not even going to try to explain what you just saw here. Um, of course, when I said I'm going to show you uh, your work and not my work, that was a lie. Um, I'm going to show a variety of, um, of projects. I would like to show some, some, some projects from the office. I would like to show some um, small intervention that I did also in, uh, in academic context under the, the format of workshops. And I would like to show also quite a few projects from academia, whether from, from Paris, uh, from Switzerland or from here. Um, it's quite difficult somehow to relate projects that are from the, the, the professional environment and from the academia. Sometimes um, it's, it's, um, it's difficult to start them with a, with a similar attitude um, and, and it has happened. So to put them all under one in, inside one bag, all the projects that, that, um, that I'm going to show here and to put a title on top has been something that, that has been complex, difficult to do and for which I have to thank someone in the audience for, uh, for helping me out with understanding how to, how to label it. So 
the lecture is called um, Machinic Protocols. Um, machinic uh, comes from the word machine, um, which I understand as a, um, as a body that transforms things uh, to make them operate or perform in space and maybe even territory. Um, the word machinic is, is the process in which this is being done. Um, that is something that I, I believe is important in, uh, in, in practice. Uh, that is something that I um, like to work with in my work and it's therefore not only related to tools that we might think are digital, um, but very often just to the process of, um, of making. Um, protocols is, um, is a set of rules um, I th that I believe we all use when we are uh, working within a creative process. Um, there can be rules of the mind, there can be rules that we apply into, uh, into matter, there can be rules that we apply into the, uh, into the design process. Um, I believe that very often we can consider these rules. The, proto the word protocol itself has sometimes, I think, a negative connotation. It's possible to be disturbed by them, but I think it's also possible really to use them, to instrumentalize them, and to make us more powerful in the in the design process. So I'm going to try to talk about all these projects in, in relationship uh, somehow to the title of this workshop, to the, the title of the lecture. And I'll start here with a very small um, project that I did here. Um, came one day by the post, uh, this postcard here, without the, without the left um, handwriting from an Italian um, journalist raising a question to which he wanted the series of architects to respond on this postcard. And the question was, what's, what is the role of the, of the architect in contemporary society? Um, I spent a couple of months thinking about what the answer could be. I wrote many answers possible. None of them were really convincing. So being unable to find what the answer was, I decided simply to change the question. And I changed the question to what can be the role of technology in contemporary society? It's probably even a, a more difficult question, but somehow I felt that I could do something with it um, and try that. So um, at the time when I was, uh, when I was reflecting on that, uh, I came across a news uh, in an article from The Guardian, which is what is written here. Finland is one of the countries to stop making cursive uh, handwriting classes compulsory. This is a news from a year ago now. So that means that in Finland, schools from now on um, in present, have the possibility not to make their kids learn how to how to handwrite. Um, I find that a very disturbing news. Uh, disturbing, not necessarily in a bad sense, but whenever I explain this project to people, there is always a strong reaction to the fact that um, that maybe we 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 can afford to stop to learn how to handwrite in um, in schools, in primary schools, um, and as a as a society. Now. I, I don't know if I agree or not to that, but it, but it, um, it somehow recalls a debate that we had in architecture school 10 years ago where the, when the computer started to come in, uh, where we had to choose whether we would want to draw by hand or to draw by computer. And, uh, um, and there were clear categorizations uh, and there was a kind of debate. Some people were sustaining that we should draw by hand because of this and this and this, and people were sustaining, sustaining the other arguments. And somehow it was very difficult to be in between the two. Um, I'm very glad that this, uh, this uh, debate is over today. I think it's not about choosing either or. I think it's about knowledge. It's about knowing different techniques and it's about making our skills and our, um, our way of thinking more, more, more powerful. And that's somehow what I try to do in this little project that is called Jules and Jules. So Jules is my nephew. He's seven. Um, he's in Brussels and he's learning how to write. So I asked him to write the, the title of the article in The Guardian. Um, and at the same time, just after he had written, I scanned the document, um, redrew it in CAD, and then asked the, the um, I won't say Kuka, I will say Jules, actually, the Jules that is behind, who was almost at the same time, there was a bit of a, there was a, bit of a time lapse. Um, we had suddenly this, this uh, seven axis uh, uh, robotic arm with a six meter uh, span uh, of, uh, of action mimicking uh, or reproducing exactly the handwriting of, um, of a child. Um, I thought it was a nice ambiguous uh, answer to the question of, of, uh, of how technology um, 
um, influences our life, but somehow it's it's the like also it's the way that I like also to think about 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 machines. No, they can they can serve so many um, so many purposes, so many aims, and 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 we can use them in so, all so many ways. So another project is is a workshop that we did here in Yak with a with a film director that is called Michel Gondry. Um, Michel Gondry is a, is a is a very special film director. Uh, he likes to craft environment almost with his hands. Uh, he really hates me saying that, but he works uh, a lot with tape and with uh, and with cardboard. And the film that he produces, um, they do have this aspect. They create an incredible imaginary world, um, yet they're very homemade or handmade. So. It was it was quite a challenge when when I went to meet him first in uh, in Paris and I told him that the school was equipped with fascinating machines and I would be, and I was curious to know what he would do if when he would be confronted to them, so he kind of uh, came up with the idea that um, um, that we should do a film here and we did this in the space of a week and we did a film that I'm I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm still not really sure how we're supposed to look at it, but I'll just explain the sequence. Um, students were asked to do a five second film into the city. They came back with these five seconds. We um, opened literally the film. We took out every one of the stills. Um, we looked a little bit at the, the, let's say the sequence, what was uh, the, the, the characteristic, the nature of the film. And then we tried to find a way to, with material, to create a three dimensional construct of that image. Um, that was first a phase of investigation, which afterwards we then somehow officialized with the use of the of the machine. So this image went into uh, a software, Rhino Grasshopper or or um, or, uh, or others. A script was created containing the information that was relative to the to the image, fed into the fed into the robot, and the robot would then create this three dimensional construct. We did this 360 times. We then rephotographed every one of, um, of these uh, three-dimensional pieces, and we reconstructed the film. Why did we do that uh, that film somehow I, I, I or let's say how to evaluate the result um, I have to admit I still don't know um, when we were presenting at the end of the workshop Michel was would say that uh, he was very interested in using the machines in a way that they in a for a, um, let's say an, an aim that they're not designed for so there was definitely this playful uh, character what I think I like about it is that we got into a, we got into a process without having any idea of what would what would come out. So in a way, the result we just have to accept it. I think, in my opinion, the the, the process was interesting, and I also I like to think as as films as filming as a machinic process uh, process in the sense that um, I think the stage on which we we film is um, is an environment that um, that contains two realities. It contains our daily life let's say one-to-one -one real time reality but it's, it also contains a, sp um, a stage set something that is constructed uh, and that is visible only from the camera point of view when the film is being shot uh, we are left with only one reality the first one the daily life one is 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 gone and somehow only the one that has been um, caref carefully staged is left so um in that sense, I think it functions like a like a machine. And when it comes to protocols, I think it was this workshop was really about establishing a series of codes of how information could be translated from one mean to another, from something that was two dimensional to three dimensional. And that is something I'm going to continue to talk about. 
This here is um, is the project of uh, of Camille Wenli in um, in the OPFL in uh, in Lausanne. She's uh, she was one of my first year students last year. Um, this is her uh, this is her second semester in uh, in in first year and. I like to talk about. Uh, I like to talk a little bit about this project because um, I started to teach in, in in diploma, and after I went to teach in fourth year, uh, which is pretty much the same in Paris. And suddenly, I, um, at, in parallel, I was teaching here digital fabrication. So all of it was um, very strongly related to uh, to to many tools that we already know how to use, already very strongly embedded within. Um, within numerical tools, and to be asked to teach in first year in um, in Switzerland, where we've um, strongly decided that computer would not be um, would not be used until the second year, was a, was a very difficult thing because how can, how could I continue to teach in a similar way with with having to draw by hand? It's uh, it's quite complex. Um, so. In, in this project, besides the fact that I think the, the, the drawing has uh, incredible uh, qualities, um, I think that there is a, there is a, a very strong, uh, let's say, protocolar attitude in the, in the mind of the student. I'll give you a couple of words to frame the, the context of the project. This is Tenerife. It's, a, it's an abandoned hotel uh, constructed illegally and, um, and left there. It probably will be one, one day deconstructed. Um, the reason why we gave that site to the students um, is because there is here the, the, um, the encounter between two uh, environments, two ecologies. One that is the one that is um, seen in concrete, that is, um, is an ecology in itself. Um, we call it a matrix. It is something that is geometrical. It's something that is spatial. And it is something that has a considerable effect on the rest of the landscape, not only just the way that it is viewed, but the way also that it um, that it, um, I think, really influences what happens around it. And there is nature, the coastline, the, the, um, the landscape around, which has its own order, which has its own um, somehow rules that regulate its ecology. This is a model that the students did trying to somehow uh, confront the two, something that is very gridded, very orthogonal, um, which can potentially help to, uh, to, to work on defining the landscape. But um, what Camille did, uh, which I thought was interesting, is she decided on an, on an architectural intention from the beginning. She decided that she would have in the building, uh, in the abandoned structure, one person, and on the coastline, far away from that, a few hundred meters, another person, and she would want them to, to communicate, to speak to each other without the use of any artificial um, equipment. So she started to get uh, interested in acoustics. She started to learn about what a parabola is, how can a, a parabola function in terms, of a, in terms of sound wave, in terms of having sound to travel. And, um, and endlessly, uh, relentlessly with her hands, she um, understood the rules that could help her to construct um, a dispositive and to construct uh, a space. So what I like about this is that she was incredibly systematic. She had an architectural intention, which I think had plenty of poetry and, and, uh, and was simple. And then afterwards, it was all about working to manage to, uh, um, to, to materialize that. And with a lot of rigor, with a lot of systematicity. So um, she had no idea where she would end up. Uh, and this is the result, which uh, confronts somehow the frame of the of the existing building with her intervention, which here looks a little bit uh, maybe uncontrolled. Um, it probably is, um, but I think it's interesting the fact that there is an intention at the beginning, and by working through it little by little, the the, the result comes out. But the result, the way that the result looks somehow here, is not really relevant. What is uh, what is important is how this thing functions, how this thing works. Um, this is another. This is another year in Switzerland. This is actually something that happened last week, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm happy to show it. Um, again, it's a, it's an approach to to design in first year where the students have uh, constructed this. This is the so this is the 220 first year students that we have. This is um, this is something that we have designed the tutors. Um, and it is very, it, it is, we call it a protostructure. It is something that has certain dimensions. It's 
um, coming from the balloon frame, this American uh, type of wooden structure, and it forms um, not only a geometrical order, but also a material order, a structural order, and also a, sp a spatial uh, order that the students are going to have to, to interact with. This is them in the space um, uh, building it. So within this uh, incredible matrix, they're going to have to think about how to uh, develop their own project, their own spaces, but within a context that is, that is clear, that is material, um, that is geographical, um, and, that is, uh, and that is structural. So I'll jump now to a, to a project of the office that is already a few years old. Uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, I don't know if it's a theoretical project, but uh, it's, um, it's a project in which we were thinking about ways to reintroduce agriculture within the city. Um, so we took, we took a couple of shortcuts at the beginning. We did a couple of um, hypothetical uh, decisions. We invented, um, in this case, uh, an incubator for lettuce, something that doesn't exist. We didn't solve the problems on how to make it work. We just um, somehow took for granted the fact that uh, maybe it could be invented, and it doesn't matter. Um, so it's an incubator in which lettuce uh, floats. Depending on the size of the lettuce, the incubator shrinks or grows, um, and it is protected within, a, within an environment. Um, this incubator travels from the top of a structure all the way to the bottom, and it travels depending on the, on the, on the age of the lettuce. So it starts with uh, age zero, and the more it travels down, the more it grows until it finally hits the... Um, the ground where it can be consumed. So this is, um, this is a design that I like because we, we, we worked a lot with numbers. We set up a kind of, a, a kind of machine, a process, where we were able uh, actually to feed in um, inputs. So we had to look at particularities of growth when it came to uh, certain vegetables. Um, and all of these numbers in terms of the day of growth, the amount of sunlight, the amount of oxygen, the amount of water, um, that it might require gave us somehow the inputs to be able to fashion the, the, um, the, the shape of the intervention. So this is just an image, uh, one, one image of one tower, take it uh, seriously or not. I take it very seriously, of course. Um, how it would spread within the city, but I think this image here is, is um, um, it's mainly uh, um, uh, for us, it was a way to prove that we were working on a system, not so much on an object. No, we were interested into the genesis of a design uh, and a design that is influenced by parameters. So I, I just want, I would like to show a little bit of the process. This is the, the kind of geometrical machine that we put in place. Uh, we worked with threads. We did physical models at the beginning. We understood how one of these incubators, uh, like a little colony of these lettuce could, uh, could go down. Um, and then working with parameters, the size of the sites, the amount of uh, the size of the neighborhood that we would like to uh, to feed with um, with um, with food, with vegetable, and so on, started to give us volumes and started to give us internal organization uh, inside. You can see here, for example, that the, the spacing between the incubator changes because the higher you are uh, or the smaller the plant is, the more light it it might need at the beginning, and and little by little the the space between the incubator would narrow. Um, I'm not going to explain the process in depth because there's a there's a lot to explain tonight. Um, but just to show that this was this really became a um, and and thanks to incredible uh, softwares that we have today and incredible people that know how to manage them. Um, we were able to produce more and more and more iterations. Uh, and also, which was interesting, um, um, through the parametric tool, we were able to, to understand what we would get out of this system. No? So I think here we, we, we had again in intentions, a little bit like Kami. Um, I, I don't think we designed necessarily the form. The form somehow was always, uh, the, the computer always needed to calculate an hour until it would give us the geometry. And then, uh, uh, and then it would create a reaction of of of, of enjoyment or not enjoyment. But I, I think that's not the, the let's say the principal um, part of this work. Um, what's important for me is to be able to create somehow a, um, a tool in which you can feed data, um, and and that in the creation of this tool, in this creation of this uh, of this uh, of this machine, somehow you do. Um, embed your architectural intentions, your intentions as, as, a, as a designer. I really strongly believe in this, uh, in this idea. Um, 
So <laughs> this is something we, we are working on since a while, actually, already in the office. Some students are going to smile. Um, you've seen plants moving. There is uh, plants moving um, quite often. Um, of course, some of the students worked on a, on a similar project in the, in the introductory studio, which was a, which was a, a pleasure. Um, it's something we, we, we are also developing in the office. I, I believe it has incredible potential and, and uh, we're having a lot of fun with Maddie, who is here in the room, to, to develop that. Um, let's see where it goes. Let's, uh, let's see. But uh, it's not done, so uh, probably another time I'll come to, to show this around. Códigos Barragán is it's um, it's a it's a workshop uh, something that I did in Mexico last year. Um, I was asked to do um, to do a small three-day workshop, which uh, was supposed to be uh, about teaching of uh, of let's say new technologies. Um, they use the expression parametric design. So I asked which which means we had what was the knowledge of the student and and um, and the response was that there was no not much knowledge uh, in terms of computer use and and no means uh, at all at least at that time precisely that's why they were asking me to come and and give a, a class rather to introduce um, and to and to and to bring knowledge them there um, so. I decided to work in, in, in a way that is quite particular. Uh, I believe that we did do parametric design, but in, in maybe quite a, a quite a special way. But before I get into the process, I, I, I need to explain um, what I got confronted to when I arrived in Mexico, visiting, not visiting um, uh, this project here, but visiting the house of Baragan um, with a Mexican architect. I remember this moment where we were in the living room and the living room has an incredible pink fuchsia um, wall that hits a yellow mustard floor, um, which is similar colors as the one we find here on the screen. And uh, we were too, the Mexican uh, architect who was delighted in front of that thought, this was a, this was a harmony, this was a, this was a nirvana in terms of the, the composition of colors. And I had a bug in my stomach that I, I couldn't look at it anymore. Uh, it was very difficult to, uh, to take. And, and somehow I took this difference in culture. I, I, I don't know if your opinion is the same, but I, I think that we, as architects in architecture school, at least in my education, I received very little um, tutoring on color, and it's something that I really don't know how to address most of the time. So I thought it was the occasion this time to deal with this kind of cultural clash that I had in that moment, and to bring um, to the University of Sinaloa these two colors and this encounter between a wall and a floor, and this line that, in my opinion, was not in my opinion, in my taste, in my culture, was very difficult to deal with. So we worked with uh, with these two RALs, with these two color codes, and we, together with the students, decided to try to find, let's say, a common ground between what both of our cultures cultures could take. And um, this is here is 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 finally the the parametric design that uh, that I talked about before. Um, we did it by hand, no computer, nor uh, no machine. Uh, just a lot of numbers um, and paper. So here you have, maybe I should uh, adjust a little bit the colors, but here you have the, the, um, the famous mustard yellow and the fuchsia pink um, brought together in, in an assembly, I think, of, uh, of 200 or 300 sheets of paper. The system is simple. We printed, um, we printed uh, the paper yellow from one side and, uh, and pink from the other, and then by folding it, whether you fold it more or less, you let one color appear or the other. And very early on with the students, we had kind of decided to blur that line where one color meets another to try to blur this, uh, this difference between the two. So to work with gradients, to work with something that is continuous, there is not a zone of this, of this installation which is pink or yellow. It's, uh, it's always a little bit of both, of course, depending from how far you look at it. So we had plenty, to, to, uh, plenty of play, playing to, uh, to do, trying to understand how yellow can become pink and how pink can become yellow. This was the room, which was, um, which was uh, all about pink and yellow. It was fantastic. And, um, and then here's the, the intervention. So it's a three-day workshop. We did um, um, a wooden structure with wires. And then, uh, and then we had these 8,000 sheets of paper, which we were, which we were hanging here. Um, now, at, 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 
maybe a couple of hours, no, a few hours before this, the day before, there were some, some people coming and, and, and asking the director of the school whether this guy that had arrived from, uh, from, from Barcelona was really coming to teach about digital technology. And everybody had doubts about uh, uh, my capacities, maybe they were right, um, but somehow they thought I was doing a big thing with paper. But the next day, something, something very nice happened. We were, um, we were running out of time, seriously. Uh, we had put 300 sheets and we needed to put another 7,000 and, uh, and, uh, and 700. There was no way we were going to make it. So as a team, as a group with the 15 students, we took a decision. We would not touch um, any material anymore. In other words, we would not do any work anymore. So every one of the students had to go within the campus and find three friends, bring them here, uh, bring them to the, to the installation and orchestrate them so that they would hang the sheets for them. So that's where suddenly the, 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 the code became clear because how do you hang a sheet considering the fact, maybe that I didn't explain, but from these two sides, the paper is pink. If you look at it from the inside, on this side, it becomes yellow. That's where the gradient occurs. No? So where you are in this immersive space, when you turn around, in a, in a kind of mechanical manner, your views, your, the color that you are facing is progressively changing from pink to yellow, back to, uh, back to pink, let's say. So that means that all of the pages that are folded here on these wires, they're folded in a different manner. So there were four numbers we had to work with. There was the position in the length and in the, and in the height. And then afterwards, there were these two folds, the top fold and the bottom fold. Um, and we, again, without, without using a computer, we had made a kind of quick math and we knew uh, precisely which, uh, which paper had to be folded in which position following which uh, criteria. And, and that became a nice moment because we had suddenly these uh, 60 students working on, on, on this uh, intervention for eight hours and basically everybody was singing numbers. It was about A7, B6, Z3, folded to two, folded to eight, but spoken at the same time by, um, by 60 people. So that, that was, a, suddenly when, when we got into that, uh, that process, it became clear what this was about. You know, there, there is of course the, um, the, the color part, but it was there very much uh, about doing a, an, inst um, uh, again, an intervention in which there is an intention that is being set, but afterwards, it's a matter of systematically following, um, following a process. So a few images of the, of the, of the outcome, uh, the colors here that are mixing together. Um, I continue with gradient, I continue with colors. We change material. This time we work with wine. Uh, this is a project that, uh, that some of you um, some of you might have seen when, uh, when, when coming to the office. It's a competition that we did, uh, which we completed a couple of months ago, which we have since then not won, unfortunately. Um, it's a building in Switzerland um, for, uh, for um, uh, it's a representation space for wine uh, selling. So they have quite special wine in the, in the French part of Switzerland on the um, northern side of the lake, and it responds. This, it's an environment with vineyards that respond to a special characteristic: the fact that they receive the sun three times. It's a it's a unique condition. They receive the sun from the sky. Um, they receive the sun from the minerals that are contained within the ground, and which actually keeps the heat and displays it and displays it later in the night. So there is an extra heat, and then there is a third source, uh, which is the lake. So the the, um, the light is reflected on the um, on the lake and hits the the grape and therefore um, raises its um, its um, its sugar quantity and therefore um, the fermentation process and the alcohol so but there is something else that we that we um, so light clearly was something we wanted to work with um, and we were wondering how maybe we could we could work with a cellar. A cellar traditionally is a is a space that is dark, that is black, in which no light comes in. Um, why is that? Because light is corrosive. Light is corrosive to art pieces. Light is corrosive to to to, to anything, and many objects need to be protected from that. Wine is one of them. But working with a um, working with a light designer. Um, um, who understands very much, much more than me, so I might get confused in the explanation, but um, he understands about the, about the waves and somehow um, 
after after many discussions, we discovered that the only light that is not damaging for the for the wine um, is actually the red lights. All the others are potentially corrosive, so we have to blank out all the light except for the red one. And there is here a very nice coincidence: is when light travels through wine, uh, it gets rid of it. Somehow the wine filters all of it, all of the light, except for the for the red lights. So that became very clear immediately. We took the decision to make a, a wine facade, um, and to uh, and to create a cellar that is uh, that is lit. That I, I still think is uh, I still don't understand why we didn't win the competition. I still I'm still convinced we really have to do it someday. Um, so we worked also with wood because we like wood, we like structure. I like this view because uh, because I think it um, it, it shows the, the biggest structural gesture that this project contains, which is related to the vineyards. This building is implemented, is is planted. Maybe I should even say within the vineyards. And this line that you see of this big cantilevered um, beam is actually following the line of the vineyard. So when you are on the site, you 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 go through the vineyards and then you get put into this uh, incredible floating perspective. Um, here maybe we see it a, a, a little bit better. Um, it's more of a bridge actually that, that I can't deliver because it's touching also the ground on our side. So that was the that was let's say the, the starting point when it came to structure and, and to spatial distribution. It has a very limpid, a very straightforward spatial organization, um, and it creates a very large surface here, um, which is open and can be used for events, for wine tasting, for seminars, for representations, um, etc. So the next phase of the the next phase of the of the exercise here was to uh, was to play with a wine facade that would create at certain areas uh, the condition that we need to be able to have all the light being blocked except for this famous red light that by the way is not red it's just it it, it is light it's just being called red in the uh, in the in the wave uh, length so um, there we had a, a, um, an amazing uh, person in the team rodrigo was uh, was um, was uh, really good in uh, in in understanding the relationship between uh, here you see um, a map of the illumination on the on the floor on the left without any facade and on the right within a facade that contains wine no? so there is uh, Rodrigo managed to um, to create a dispositive um, or let's say let's call it a machine again or maybe even a machinic protocol um, in which we would modify we would design the facade according to the need that we have inside so we can consider that the map here is what uh, decides what the facade should look like so we worked with gradients because we didn't need to have the red uh, the red um, effect everywhere and these are some of the results of the of the um, of what the building would look like what the building will look like. Um, yeah, so here we see the inside, the somehow living inside this uh, this important wooden structure, uh, the internal distribution, and here with uh, with the performative uh, with the performative facade. Yeah, one day. Um, okay, I'll, I'll I'll go back to some academic work. I'll go back to uh, to um, to Paris for a moment. Um, and before um, before explaining the next project, I need to do a little parenthesis on on cartography, on mapping. This is, and I'm just going to show two images of this. This is an exercise that I did in in Paris always for my third and fourth year students, which were the first two weeks of the of the semester. And what I was doing through this exercise is um, taking a let's let's call it a generic space or a space that is uh, that contains few a few obstacles. And ask the students through a, a mapping and a cartographical process to prove the fact that um, um, that this space is not homogeneous as it might seem to be. So it set up this exercise here, set up in the Jardin du Luxembourg, which is a, a French garden that is ordered by uh, by very clear lines. And the student focused. I lost the cursor. On this space, on this space here, that is obviously surrounded by. Um, by trees that, that create a certain environment, etc. But somehow when she went to the first drawing that she did was basically a white sheet because she said the floor is flat um, and there is nothing there. There is um, 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 Gustav um, Bateson um, in, in The Ecology of Mind uh, states that um, 
he has a very nice quote that says, what gets onto the map is differences. Um, and I also believe that uh, we, we do mapping to, to highlight differences in the territory, whether it's about topography, whether it's about trees, whether it's about, it's about anything. No? It, it's, all about, uh, it's all about finding something that is not the same in one place and another, and then finding a way to apply this back to the, to the drawing. So I think that this is, a, um, this is one of these maps that were created by the students. I'll explain the, pro the process in a moment, but it's, it's um, basically mapping people. Uh, how they cross this apparently homogeneous, non-hierarchical surface. Um, but then what she did after the people would have traveled through the space is she asked them their age. And um, she <laughs> discovered this, uh, this uh, nice or not nice uh, formula that, uh, that, um, that relates our age to the amount of energy that we emit. And um, I don't know if you know this, but we, the, the, the amount of energy that our body emits in terms of joules, so it's a physical data, um, grows, follows a, a, a curve that grows from our birth. So when we are two years old, we emit a certain quantity of energy. When we are four years old, we emit more energy. And, and this curve somehow reaches its peak at 24. Um, and then from 24 years old, it starts to decrease again. Um, so, so that's another way to understand where is the middle of, uh, of one life, which I think some of us have already passed. Um, so she, she was then able to transform the path of people into, uh, into this kind of vectorial um, language, highly questioning the conventions of, uh, of, uh, of existing cartography, and, um, and being able to, with these lines, um, create a drawing which is about uh, intensities, which is about, I think, areas that are uh, less white, more more white, um, and I think it's it's a it's a it's a very well done drawing, and it's a very instructive piece of work because it's uh, it shows that first space is not about on and off condition zero and one things don't happen here and not there. Um, I think that space operates with a, with a, with transitional states, um, and I think through this uh, through this project here she demonstrated it. What is this map for? I don't know. I, I don't think we should use it to start to place solar panels, or uh, it, it probably wouldn't work. Um, but I think it is an understanding of space, and it can serve uh, in in many senses in a creative design process. So, I run this studio for three years, um, which is called Re, Re. Um, and the, the, let's say, the, besides the methodology, the brief that I worked with were the relict, the relict uh, abandoned buildings within Europe. So the first week of the, stu of, the, of the studio was about finding in Europe structures that were abandoned, uh, recent structures. And here was always the, par the, the particularity that they always found buildings that were constructed for a very specific purpose. And this purpose was no longer valid, let's say, or, or, or no longer feasible. So these buildings were left abandoned. And since nobody knew, they were built for something so specific that nobody knew how to reconvert them into something else. And they are all vote to be, um, to be demolished. So what the students had to do is to understand what is this particularity that these buildings have and to try to invent a new use that would be, that would be based on that. And we look here and at, at one project, which is in, um, in a fantastic place, my, uh, as you can see, my homeland, Belgium. It's a cooling tower uh, near the town of, uh, of Charleroi. And the student decided to go, uh, to go there and to map it. Um, I, I, I like the fact of showing this image here and saying this is what we're going to map because it does look like something that is completely homogeneous. You, you, you wouldn't really know where to start to prove that this part of the, of the structure is radically different from this part of the structure. But somehow that's the exercise that they took on. Same with the inside, uh, where here we see at least something that is asymmetrical, which is the light condition that hits it. Um, and, the and, and afterwards, actually really studying the morphology of the building and what are its characteristics. A cooling tower, therefore, uh, these blades near the bottom that uh, um, that deal with uh, with airflow and quite precise in quite precise manner with temperatures of um, of air. So they gone onto the, the the drawing board. Let's say they created these drawings, which were first about reconstructing the uh, precisely the um, the structure and the form of the building, um, defining also a coordinate system, being able to understand in space. Um, uh, locations of things um, and then they started to play with data while they were on site they measured 
they measured um, they measured light, they measured humidity, uh, because that's what they thought would give them the clue to understand that this chimney was not uh, a homogeneous uh, field. Um, and then back into the studio, they worked with wind. It was a little bit a uh, kind of kitchen uh, uh, kitchen wind uh, simulation, um, but nevertheless, it gave them results. So they were blowing uh, smoke that was coming through the bottom of the structure, going up, and they they, they suddenly had um, somehow a, a mapping to system to understand how the inside of this chimney would work. No, they. Um, they decided to work with housing. They took at some point the decision to say that this chimney could be converted into a village. There was sufficient structure to be able to, um, to take advantage of this skin almost as if it was a foundation, but a foundation with special uh, properties when it came to ventilation, when it came to light, um, and also potentially when it came to humidity. So um, this is their master plan. It's a, it's a map of uh, it's a map of the chimney. It's a map of the skin of the chimney. It's an unfolded drawing back onto the plane. So I, I find it interesting to say that it's a master plan because I don't often see master plans that are not flat, master plans that are vertical. It's quite an atypical thing to do. And they started to put there the information of their, of their uh, mapping exercise. And eventually when they accumulated their different studies, um, they, uh, they discovered this map, which I think is, is, uh, is quite fascinating to think that this is a map of the wind, of the light, and of the humidity conditions along the along the facade of this building. So they are claiming that this, that this is this, that this is the same thing, which I find really fascinating. And I think they were honest in the process. So then this map becomes an operational tool. Uh, it becomes a, a tool set, let's say, to to start to locate objects, to start to locate perforations uh, within the skin, and to start to create zones of density within this um, within this uh, this facade so we're back to the axonometric we're back to the numbers all of these coordinate moments possess from now on a specific information that is going to be able to somehow provide um, requirements for size of a, of a living unit and then this is their first attempt uh, of transformation of this surface into an inhabitable um, environment village let's say um, they probably would need another couple of years to 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 develop the project in a in a in a, um, in a more uh, let's say advanced manner. But I've got a, a couple of images of their working process. This is the studio. This is how they um, how they materialize their uh, their research into into this model, starting little by little to embed functions, circulations, um, um, communal spaces, etc. And then here is the the. Um, the, the last image of that project. I, I, I think it's probably, I've, I've done this, uh, this course for three years and I think it's one of the most convincing projects. I think they, they've really managed to, uh, to deal well, well with the cartography in a way that it becomes a tool and it becomes a, um, a tool that materializes intentions. Um, so as in many of the projects, they, I think they had really, while they were doing the mapping, while they were drawing their maps, the cartography, documents I think they really had no idea of what the outcome would be like you know and it was it's very much the it's very much let's call it the formula the code or the or the um, or the machine that provided that results and of course there is tweaking to do but uh, but there is this there, there is this process that I believe really does work somehow um, Again, this is a this is a project from Academia. This is the last semester that I did in Paris, and um, what I decided to do there is is um, I knew that it was my last semester teaching, and I decided to uh, to uh, to take a risk to go a little bit against the the. There was a change of director, and I was not really getting along with the director, and I knew that this was my my. Uh, I was soon going to end, so I decided to go for something a bit more daring, and we took the Cathedral of Beauvais which is, uh, used to be the, the highest cathedral in France. Uh, it collapsed a couple of times, um, and now it is only half built. So uh, one of the, let's say, great um, um, patrimony of, of, of the French Gothic, uh, I took the student into trying to think about how to finish its construction today, which was a very enjoyable process. Um, but we took the decision at, at the beginning with the students that we would redraw, we would map the, the, the cathedral itself 
only with uh, straight segments and um, and um, and arcs. There is a there is something that I like about Gothic is that these buildings were constructed with, let's say, fairly basic means means in terms of making, but also means in terms of thinking. Uh, they were essentially drawn uh, on sand, uh, sometimes on plaster. Uh, they didn't have pencils. They didn't have. Uh, they almost didn't use ink. And their measuring tool was mainly consisting of a of a rope. So to give to the students the arc as a as a kind of measuring device and and going to the Bove Cathedral and trying to model the entire cathedral by only using string um, was 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 a very nice process and it actually really did work. The dimensions probably are not exact, which I think is irrelevant. What is important is the dimension or the relationships between different objects. No? So here you have an an analysis. Of, um, of students drawing the columns. Um, of course, when you look at a, a Gothic column, what is incredible is, is a Gothic column is, um, is a witness somehow of what happens above. So it's a, it's a kind of um, uh, embedded, uh, let's say, message of what the structure is like. All of these circles that you see are higher up, something that becomes uh, the nerve that frames the surface. So. Um, and then this is one of the one of the roses, very typical of the Gothic era, where the students had to somehow deeply get into the hierarchies of how um, of how stone is carved and how uh, a Gothic at this point, uh, Gothic flamboyant, um, could be crafted. No? So really trying to understand the orders uh, that are hidden between uh, between design and between making and behind making. So. Um, um, without getting into too much depth, they then they then really managed to make uh, incredible models at a one to fifty scale. Um, I think it's I, I didn't think we would get there because to three D model a cathedral and then afterwards to actually make it, um, if we consider that this is somehow a satisfying model, and it 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 was a big work, but it somehow it got them so much into a, a way of thinking that was. That was rigorous. That was systematic. That the rest of the semester was was uh, was also incredible. So there are a couple of drawings of some of the results. These are students that decided to completely open up the cathedral into the public space outside and worked with uh, photography done by by tourists to be able to continue to construct the space um, of the cathedral. This was a student uh, that was weaving through the cathedral. He had done a historical uh, analysis of the cathedral of, of Beauvais, which has a very strong relationship to weaving. And he was therefore inventing a kind of machine that would weave through the space and enable uh, to have other activities that are not religious um, within the church. And then these are the students that had, had drawn this, uh, this column that you saw previously that decided to make an inhabitable column uh, and, uh, and um, if I'm not mistaken, it was a, a sky observatory. So they perforated the church to the top um, and created the space again that is not religious for the for the people. Um, I, I had a, I, I, I like a lot the um, the Gothic. I'm I'm not the only one. Uh, there is a project that we did in the office. Um, in uh, in Mons for 2000 and, uh, 2015. In 2015, Mons was capital of culture. We entered a competition for uh, theater plays, knowing that we were not about to uh, uh, to propose a play, but rather we had understood that there was a, a lack of spaces to uh, to do uh, to do street art. So we submitted the competition with a, with a proposal that was completely wrong, let's say, but anticipating the fact that there might be a, an, an option there, and. Um, and we found this uh, this this um, this cathedral, uh, Wodru, which uh, which directly actually this project was before the semester uh, done in Paris. But I like to explain it in that sequence um, because here materiality uh, becomes an important factor. So um, we looked at at, uh, at at this church. We drew this church in a similar way that the students did. We understood it as arcs. Um, we understood it as line in compressions. And we decided to work with another material that is glass fiber that pretty much works in the opposite manner. Um, so we took the shape of the ogive, but we tried to reinterpret it as something that doesn't work in compression, but something that works in tension. And um, and I have to say it works well. We 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 did this this prototype at one to three in the office, really testing the the potential of this let's say material assembly, how it um, how it works, and. Um, before I explain more, um, 
when I talk about machining protocols, um, I, I, I think that through the lecture, there's different ways to understand it. Uh, let's say different topic. One of these, one of these topic is the one of materiality. Um, materials behave in a certain way. Um, I think that materials have their own properties. There is something that the engineers like to work with, which uh, which is called form finding, which I think is a, is an incredible way to to relate to material. It's about understanding precisely their their properties, and understanding and and therefore. Um, um, learning how to settle them into assemblies into forms into uh, into structures that they can that they can um, that they can do no so i was remembering while i was preparing the lecture i was remembering when i was in first year and second year and third year trying to draw a curve by hand on the um, um, on the drawing board and I think for three years I never managed to draw a, a good curve and I did it with a French curve and I did with all so many things but this curve was always wrong and then one person showed me uh, he just took a piece of wood and he bent a piece of wood um, as the as the shipbuilders would bend it on the on the ship of a on the um, on the surface of a boat he bent this piece of wood on my uh, on my drawing board with a couple of constraints and then i drew this line and this line this curve suddenly became perfect and this is the curve that the wood settles in so for me that's the easiest way maybe to understand the, the concept of form finding um and i think this is what we use here because here in terms of a of a construction setup um this model took us a long time to plan, probably a couple of days, but then actually the act of making it merely took a couple of hours. Um, why did it take only two hours? Because it's the material that does the work. It's the material that sets into the shape. It's not us that have to form it in a specific way. We just anchored it to the ground and then decide where it would have to, connect, to be connected on top. And then um, the material did the work for us. So then we managed to go back into, into the 3D model. We managed uh, to understand the relationship between the curve and the elasticity of the material. And then we played actually in the computer to create a catalog of potential structures that, we, that, this, that this system would enable us to do. So here we have um, just a few of them where you see we're changing the rhythm, little by little we're changing the, the shape, the, the axes that the, that the general geometry is being governed by. Um, and this was for us our tool set. No, of course, it's much more vast than what I'm showing. That what I am showing here. Um, but it, it, some. I, I don't know if it was comforting, or I don't know if it was suddenly opening a lot of opportunities into understanding how to suddenly attack uh, the context, the site. So strong of that, then. Um, we, uh, we, parametri we parametricized it, and uh, one thing that I like, which maybe we can pay attention to while it's playing, is the, let's say, the spacing between two of these poles. No? Sometimes there's a meter, sometimes there's 80 centimeters, sometimes uh, there is less. So we related that to, uh, to, um, to program somehow. We related to the porosity of the surface. When sticks were 30 centimeters away apart one from another, we considered that people couldn't walk through anymore. So um, the way that we designed this was, um, was not to start to plan the poles around. It was actually to play with the plan, um, which I think I have an image here. Yeah, it's to play with the plan. Um, and to decide zones of porosity or not porosity. This is a, I didn't mention yet, this is a public building. It's a stage for theater. It's a place with a, it's a space that house a cafeteria, a shop for the manifestation of, a, of, a, of culture. And, um, and therefore it's a building that can stay uh, partially open and in, in, in other areas it is covered inside. And also, I, I like the fact that somehow we managed to, to, to give let's say special requirements or necessity in the plan and then this is eventually what gave us uh, the geometry um, that came out of the out of out of the poles and uh, here's some, some images so we imagine that this structure is is covered inside with a with an etfe waterproofing uh, skin probably need a bit of work more to 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 make it happen but um but i think the one to three model that we did in the office or prototype really proved that um that um, that there is a lot of possibility to that system. So um, this is definitely a project that will that will continue and and uh, um, that will have a future. 
Another another project that um, that works with phone finding that works with material as uh, as an assembly that that uh, that is form found and that uh, and that is not imagined from the from the beginning but that very much settles in the shape that the constraint that we give him um, that is a project that we did in um, in Russia for um, for a competition it's in Yaroslav and the the brief was to convert this sports facility uh, where there is a, an interesting split in, in level. It acts a little bit as a stadium. They want to convert this space into an art, into this sports space into an art space. So they ask essentially for a, for a cover for it. So we started to look a little bit at what was uh, at, at, at Russia, although I have to admit that I've never been there and, and that my, my culture is super limited. Um, but we looked at the onion domes, uh, quite fascinated by the geometry. And um, since we're in Barcelona and the tradition of the cultural, uh, of, the, of the architects of, uh, of, uh, of Barcelona, we decided to put them upside down. Um, um, for the form finding process. And a little bit like, uh, like this guy did. Um, and then thinking that by maybe tensioning a surface, we can imagine that this surface can become a, a concrete surface, and 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 we can manage to uh, uh, we can manage to construct it with uh, with uh, with quite um, nice uh, thin concrete shell. So the process started in the office where we started very playful. We hung the fabric on the ceiling, we hung weight onto it, and we kept on imagining that this was the upside down version of what would be constructed you know, in such a manner. Photoshop did help. Um, so starting to look at, at what would happen here, certain light conditions uh, starting to starting to happen, um, maybe a little bit a, a kind of circus like space. At the beginning, there was not much logic being done, but the more we process, the more we were able to uh, to parameterize it and to and to take somehow rigorous decision, um, which little by little led us embed architectural quality within this. Uh, um, or necessities within this process. So we started to perforate. We would then solidify the, the surface with resin um, and then put it back on the floor and, and get a resulting surface, a resulting structure, which was interesting because sometimes it collapsed uh, and sometimes it didn't, which was as much as we needed to know about structure somehow. So then we were ready for the final configuration um where we work then really with the precise site dimensions uh decided to work with a series of columns within the space projected the that was a nice moment where we would project the the cad information immediately on the on the surface and start to sew and start to cut uh create these patterns put the surface back into the ceiling introduce a tension uh, sorry a compression member to uh, separate. There were two surfaces by then, so it became really a surface that had that had a volume and therefore a structural depth. Hanging the balloons again, um, and then again the the, the form finding process that lets this uh, material uh, body, let's say, shed, settle into a shape which has a lot of structural potential. So this is a view from inside. And this is a view from inside again, when the surface is solidified, is impregnated with resin, and uh, and and the people are finally there. Um, for the sake of the competition, we we um, we had to submit a drawing. So I, I would like to say we were forced to do this drawing because in this process, drawing was basically irrelevant, and we did it simply for the sake of submitting. But uh, but really, this was a um, let's say an, an investigation. Uh, on on making no and on on discovering potential of of materiality of uh, of structure, so we did much more Photoshop than we did uh, than we did drawing or, or that we did three D modeling. So a couple of shots of the results. All right, um, I have a couple more projects. Not not. Uh, not not many more. Um, this is one that is called bent. I explained before about this piece of wood that uh, that um, for me was a revelation on on especially on my drawing board the fact that wood can bend uh, in 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 such an incredible manner. This is a workshop that we did in uh, in in November in Genova, where Genova has. I'm, I'm not going to get into much detail, but Genova has, uh, has an incredible tradition into boat making which is somehow now um, 
uh, disappeared a little bit, at least from the city center. While before we imagined that Genova was a city in which boats were being made, uh, a kind of open shipyards where the whole city would be somehow leaving the rhythm of ship shipmaking. We try to somehow to do a, a short event, three or four days, in which we would bring back uh, for the space of a few days the, the ship making. So here we worked with, uh, with two systems. We work with an orthogonal system uh, that you can see um, here where, so it's, again, it's a kind of matrix. It's an orthogonal system because it's very simple to screw and it was one of the, the um, uh, it's a quick project. So this structure, we managed to erect it in a couple of days with a more intricate geometry uh, form or assembly would probably not have been possible, but this is this structure is is um, is a frame. It's a frame for two purposes. It's a frame for inhabitation, because this is a project that creates a couple of um, of let's say visual connections to the city. It's in a very beautiful square of uh, of Geneva, and then afterwards there is the other let's say uh, um, corp that comes and inhabits this uh, this structure, which is the one of the bending wood. Um, which completes, let's say, the visual dispositive, and finally is this thing that is reminiscent of a, of the shipyard of um, of boat making. And um, I don't know if it looks like a boat in in, in a publication. It's been called a, a sail, which was really not the point. It was really supposed to be the the, the um, how do you say the bottom of the boat, huh? Hull. The hull of the boat, um, but anyway, some of the public that was uh, that was walking through the square did ask us why we were doing a boat there, which uh, I thought was a was a very nice compliment. Um, okay, I'm. Um, um, yes, I've talked about. Um, I've talked. I think I've talked about uh, what I understand by by machinic protocols. Um, I think one of the, of course, we are always driven by how we want things to to look in a certain way, no? But um, I think much more important is the way that things perform, the way that um, the way that things work. Um, and I think I've kept the 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 project that is the most complex, maybe even the most ambiguous for the for the for the end. Um, it's a project that. Um, I don't know. It's it's a it's a very important project somehow that uh, that I'm doing in collaboration with a lot of you. It's this exhibition that uh, I already mentioned in the introduction. It's called Traces: Delineating Incidents. Um, I'm now much more relaxed than at the beginning of the of the lecture. Um, it opens on the 11th of May in the in the artistic circle San Yuk, and I really would like to use the opportunity to invite you all. Um, I think it will be a great moment, and and um, and together with Rodrigo, and actually with the help of many others, uh, we we are creating. I think something that is um, that is, or let's say, we are helping the students to create something that I think is really special. Um, this is a piece of work that is ongoing. Uh, it's an investigation. Mm, it started in the first term, in the first uh, in the first term of uh, of Yak before Christmas under uh, a title that I had given, which was called Automatic, uh, automatic uh, Drawing and slash somehow Drawing Machines. Um, maybe I, I had mentioned to the student the surrealist um, attitude of, for example, André Breton, who tried to do drawing without using his subconscious to try to, to somehow to try to, uh, to separate the mind the psychic from the from the act, and therefore to do that as a way to to um, in the creation of a piece of art to get away from the desire to represent something and to find um, and to find other things that were not necessarily figurative. Um, therefore, this therefore in, in in the let's say in the surrealist uh, um, perspective, the important is not on the result. I think the important is on the process. And there is another person I'd like to, to, to mention here, which is uh, Bart, Roland Bart, which is uh, who's uh, the French critique. Um, he has incredible writings on, uh, on, on the work of Tom Lee, uh, actually, where he mentions, he talks about art not as a, not as a result, but he talks about art as a, as a gesture. He says that what is different between all of the artists is the fact that the gesture 
is um, is specific, is different. And he talks about um, he talks about the um, the l'acte réglé, which would be the the ruled act uh, mentioning the gesture. He's talking about the arm. He's talking about the fact that the arm has uh, has its rules. It it has its constraints, um, and this is something that somehow the artist uh, is really putting to uh, to to work when he's um, when he's drawing. So I think we we try to go a little bit in in this direction with this uh, with this project. The um, the the brief was very straightforward. Um, I specified the thickness of the pen that the student should use, but then I told them to find uh, a source of energy in, uh, that in their daily life, let's say a kinetic uh, thing that happens, um, and to put a pen onto it and to get it to draw, which might seem... Uh, and, and if some of you are suddenly are curious, I would really encourage you to do it because it's terribly fun and it gives incredible results. Um, so um, they were, uh, after one week, uh, Rodrigo, you remember incredible drawings coming, uh, coming out, and, and that's when we were, became conscious that was just, this was just the beginning of a, of, a, of a process. So the drawing here from uh, Lina and Pedro are about um, pigeons. Uh, pigeons are a source of energy. Um, and, uh, and they had somehow uh, invented a, a machine uh, or a mechanism in which the seeds uh, were let's say, um, within a pot that was standing on, uh, uh, on pens. So when pigeons were attacking this, uh, this, uh, this pot of seeds, somehow these pens were moving. And, and um, can we read a pattern in these drawings? Probably. Maybe it's quite difficult. But, um, but the fact that uh, um, th there is somehow this, this question of movement, uh, movement is embedded. Um, and, uh, and, and time also. No, I think this brief somehow partially came um, with the idea that, that um, as architects, very often we are not used to working with time. We're not used to working with movement. Um, and this was a way to, uh, to challenge that. This is another set of drawing, and, and uh, I'll mention it because I'm happy about it, but these are pages from a catalog that is about to come out. Um, um, which will uh, compile all of the drawings that, uh, that will be featured in this exhibition on the 11th of, uh, of May. And um, I, I, like, uh, I like this sequence here uh, because they, they, uh, they look nice, uh, absolutely. <laughs> But also because there were the the, mom, the there were the, the occasion of uh, Rodrigo and me having a disagreement about their meaning, which I think was uh, one of the strong moments uh, of the of the of this investigation, at least for for me, probably for you too, in terms of recognizing some of the meaning or the value of uh, of this work. This is um, this is a very nice project by Lily and, and Jean Sebastian. Uh, they went to the metro. They put a board. Uh, they put a board in the metro that was suspended by some uh, some springs, um, and then in the middle of this board, they would lay uh, in the metro a ball that was impregnated with ink. So the metro accelerating, decelerating, going up, going down, going left, going right, would somehow propel this ball into a non-linear or a non-rectilinear, uh, let's say, um, direction towards the towards the side of the of the board. So it, it, it created these drawings that are therefore drawings of a, of a metro line. And um, this, this, this conversation that we had with Rodrigo um, was, was nice because um, we were trying to, to understand what was the main point here. And, and, uh, and Rodrigo was saying that these are maps. These are cartographical exercises. These are drawings of the metro line, which I just said. So it, it actually uh, does. I also actually agree with that definition. Um, the, sometimes in the in the teaching, we were we were asking them, Lilian and Jean Sebastien, whether um, from this drawing they would be able to reproduce a precise uh, 3D model of the of the of the tunnel of the metro. And I like to think that it's somehow possible. No, maybe there is a slight degree of error, uh, but um, but I think it's possible. And, and in that sense, it's a, it's a map. It's a cartographical exercise. And in that sense, it's a, it's a machinic process because it takes a three-dimensional environment. Um, and through this device, which is the, which is the, the suspended table, 
it transformed that information into something that is a uh, that is two-dimensional but also exists within a within a territory within a within a space so um, all of the drawing i think they do convey this characteristic of uh, of um, of the map uh, of the fact that there is potentially an, an aller-retour between the process but for me there was there was something else that i think is is quite hard to to express that one can read into the drawing and and uh, the question came if uh, if the metro let's say if the tra trajectory of the metro was to be the same every time exactly the same every time it is being made that means the degree of acceleration being precisely the same the slowing down the the sequence in the stop um, etc if we were to repeat the experience several times with exactly the the same conditions would we get the same drawings that's the question somehow i've been having in my mind for six months and i still don't have the answer and i'll finish off with this video here from uh, conan mercedes Thank you. Ça va, je crois que trop long. So, thank you so much, Edouard, um, for taking us through your vision of how, what, what did you say? Materializing intentions. Um, so, machinic protocols the future, hopefully. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite anyone who has any questions to let me know. Does anybody have any questions? The student in the front row has a question. <laughs> Hello, Edouard. Um, yeah, very, very... Actually, I don't come to many lectures at the EG. <laughs> so it's really nice to, you know, to, to see you sharing with us uh, all your work, and uh, um, um, even that I'm, I'm a very critic of architecture lately, and probably mainly in the recent architecture, especially uh, because the perversion in which architecture has turned into, um, and probably very few people has remained with the freedom and with the will to experiment just for the sake of experimentation. Uh, I think it's that's something that I really appreciate from, from, from all of your work. Um, and, and what is interesting also is like uh, even if in, in every single act of randomness there is not there is not random, it generates some some kind of uh, form. No, um, so out of that experimentation of, of you know through randomness, uh, what what drives your intentions? That's a, that's a tough question, and I think that's that's definitely what uh, what we explored in the in the first semester. The, I've always been fascinated by the by the accidents and by the the, the process of indetermination and of something that um, that you're not fully in control of. I don't know if it's a I don't know if it's a, if it's related to the fact that maybe one doesn't trust himself and therefore needs to relate to external mechanisms. Um, but I, I'm never able just to, to, to draw a solution to a problem in a, in, in a way that I always somehow need to take the very, 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 very long way around to find a solution. And it never comes uh, immediately. So I think sometimes relying to, to, to things that are external to your mind 
when it comes to thinking, designing, creating, is, is something that, uh, that helps a lot. And not being able to know at the beginning, to somehow to, to create these mechanisms in which you try to think about how things work, but not how things look. To me, it feels like a, a way that I feel very comfortable with, uh, with working. When I'm too focused on how something should look, should look Normally, it's where my, it's where maybe I'm happy with the solution for a very short moment, and very quickly I'm I, I'm dissatisfied with it. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? He's not your professor anymore, so please feel free to speak your minds. Now, now is the right time to say what you've been wanting to say for six months. <laughs> I don't get it. I need to go. I need to go. <laughs> he doesn't get it. Well, maybe if you come back next year. <laughs> no, um, maybe. Edouard and I have spoken a lot about this kind of this this stuff. Um, so. She's a complex. Um, <laughs> I also sometimes don't get it, Dirk. Um, no, I don't really have a question. I mean, I guess my question is always to you, like, where, where do you want to go with this? And I mean, I remember, <laughs> it's a difficult question. Just Next give me, just, <laughs> just let me give you some context because we had a conversation with Edouard about your first term studio. Um, and he, he, it was in the context that Edouard was going to write an article um, and he wanted to include your projects. And he started obsessing over the fact that this article was about the fact that cars would no longer be in cities. And I kept saying that I thought that cars had nothing to do with what he was trying to say. Um, and I kept asking him, you know, but where do you want to go with this? You know, and, and we slowly sort of deconstructed everything that was in the article to find out that in fact cars had nothing to do with it. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm. I'd like to thank you. I'm super emotional about you being here. I'm super proud of him. Um, <laughs> something a bit like a mother now. <laughs> so once again, thank you to Edouard. And um, I'd like to once again invite everyone to come on the 11th of May at 7 o'clock at the Centre San Luc, yeah, to the opening of this fabulous exhibition that you guys got the opportunity to see a little bit of at the end. Um, and once again, an applause for Edouard.